Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to the session right before lunch. Bob did a good job of uh, kind of outlining the base work for the talks moving forward. Now it's my job to manipulate your decisions for lunch moving forward. And then Mike will tell you where to get them in his food service update. And then David will tell you that they're all good for you and you can eat as much as you want. So uh, we're looking forward to those talks as well. No, I, you know, I really want to touch base on, you know, product developer side. You know, the FDA does a good job of keeping us product developers in business uh, by making some of these mandates. And then these are just some of the struggles and some of the options out there um, for the partial hydro alternatives. You know, partial hydrogenation is a unique um, product. It's one that, you know, you can um, manipulate and stop depending on the iodine value saturate since uh, trans level, no matter where we're at in the process. So you can go anywhere from a creamy shortening all the way to a fully hydrogenated product um, at the end and stop anywhere in between depending on the application. So a pretty unique process and product and one that can provide struggles for product developers and end users moving forward. You know, well, <clears throat> why was it so painful to replace trans? Well, the first thing that we hear quite often from customers is stability. You know, trans fat are very resistant to oxidation. Uh, they also create a unique crystal structure that uh, works well in solid fat um, structural type solutions. Uh, performance, uh, it's, it's very high, uh, highly functional, robust. It's got a wide uh, temperature range that you can use it at. Um, and then the economics, you know, we kind of built it into our um, processing to make it an easy flow through um, to stop wherever we want it, depending on where the customer um, needed it for functionality. So economically, it just made a lot of sense. So replacing that can be quite difficult. In doing so, a lot of the um, different producers out there took uh, different generational approaches, you know, as well as the end users. When the FDA made their announcements that they were going to remove the grass status from partially hydrogenated oils, one of the first things a lot of people did was just make a switch to the next, next economical product out there. And typically, that was a foam product or a commodity, i.e. interesterified product. Um, in doing so, they found out that uh, partial hydro maybe had some characteristics that don't allow for these to be just drop-in replacements. Uh, they ran into a lot of troubles that we'll get into in further slides. Then some of the uh, suppliers out there got a little smarter and a little further along in their development and came up with Generation 2, which maybe incorporates some of the um, specialized products, more custom built for the applications that are out there. Um, Stratus has come across the Swex technology. You can see the two pictures on the bottom. Um, both of these products are palm oil under a microscope, the same palm product. Uh, one is what's typical in the industry, especially under the Generation 1 products. You can see the large needle-like crystal structures, and that will pose problems later on. And then next to that, with no additives, just a process change, uh, you can also see our Flex technology that gets us that more unique, uh, uniform crystal structure um, that we're used to, especially seeing with partial hydro. And so um, that's done as well, especially in the Generation 2 um, products. And then you have our Generation 3 products. You know, even when you kind of solve some of the problems with the plasticity and the flex Generation 2 type products, or maybe even some of the uh, different compounds involved in palm that you kind of separate out and make custom products with, you also get these Generation products that still have some stability issues. Um, so that's why it's great to have new products in the industry like high leg soybean oil. Um, to give us some of that uh, stability as well as that plasticity that we're looking for in those special applications and um, combine that with some of the technologies that we developed in Generation 2 products, it's a no-brainer and it's offered a great drop-in replacement for many of the products out there. Here's a good uh, picture of how some of the struggles not only were on the application side but also on the transit side. Uh, we're in Minnesota, Minneapolis. I think my Uber driver said two weeks ago there was 12 inches of snow out there. Yesterday, I got in pretty late, but it was still over 70 degrees. I imagine it's going to be pretty warm today as well. That makes a, can make a heartache for a lot of those Generation 1 type products. Um, pictures on the top 
show that and um, some of the storage challenges that are out there. Um, these products are all intersterified products, intersterified soy products. The picture on the left is a traditional IE product using that generation one technology. And you can see that the structure doesn't allow it to hold up very well to temperature of use, 85, 90 degrees, which are pretty common in transit and warehousing temperatures. In the middle, you have the generation two flex technology where you manipulate the crystal using processing um, technologies and you're left with something that holds its shape a lot nicer. Then you get the generation three on the right with the IE highlight soybean oil and you can see that it holds the structure together really well. This way when it gets to the customer it still has got a good uh, crystal structure and you're able to use it pretty easily in the um, application that you're after. Uh, these products are all um, what we would consider an all-purpose type product and so um, it's good to have products in the middle or on the end there especially when you're dealing with the temperature fluctuations that we deal with on the transportation side. And if you look on the bottom you can see we have a special tool that is known pretty well in the industry known as a te texture analyzer and we measure that texture throughout the life of the um, shortening. And you can see with some of the Generation 1 products out there, there are some fluctuation in the uh, texture of the products there. PHO is pretty stable at time 0 and 12 months. And you can see that there are some fluctuations in, in that texture um, with the palm and commodity IE products. And then on the end, you see the intersterified high light soil that stays pretty stable even on the texture side due to its crystalline structure. So. The first application I'm going to talk about um, is deep frying. This is one that we knew would do really well with the um, high lake soybean technology out there. You see on the top, the pictures come across not so great on the screen, but uh, the picture up on the uh, top left, the 100% high lake soybean oil. This is after a controlled frying study where we hand cut the potatoes, uh, we hand blanch them, we hand weigh them, and we treat every fryer the same. And after 24 days, you can see kind of the difference on the back of the fryer. This is what we kind of commonly refer to as polymerization on the back of the fryer. Um, some of your food service companies have other names for them, but um, we'll keep this G-rated. It's really hard to clean. If you've never cleaned a fryer before, this is a, a big time stop for a lot of the food service industries out there in particular, especially those that made the switch from partial hydro soy to 100% commodity soy or a blend that contains a high amount of that. Uh, that sticky varnish on the back, you have to actually boil out with a caustic material, scrub really hard, and what happens is you start to wear on that stainless steel coating on the fryer, and it actually can reduce the, uh, the life of your fryer. Um, but using high LA soybean oil, you can also increase the life of your oil and cut down on that polymeriz polymerization on the back of the fryer. On the bottom we showed, okay, not everybody may want to use high leg soybean as a whole um, as a substitution for partial hydro, whether it be for flavor or um, if they want to keep the same flavor that they had based off a of custom blend or just the price in general. Um, there are options out there to use it as a blend component and this is what you know, we're really excited about as a supplier is all the um, advantages of using high leg soy as a blend component. And if the picture showed a little bit clearer, maybe you can see it a little bit, you can start to see as the amount of high lake soy increases in the blend, um, the polymerization on the back um, decreases. You know, we've seen this go down even to the percentage, single digit percentages, an effect on polymerization on the back of the fryer. So it's pretty exciting um, when you can extend fryer life, but also extend the life of your fryer because you're having to boil out less times. Um, and, and you know, worry about scraping off that um, valuable stainless steel coating on the fryer. So, some of the common complaints that we get with frying, especially those that made this early switch to a commodity soy or palm, are smoking, flavor, and obviously stability that we spend a lot of time on. You know, you have a lot of polyunsaturates in there, it's going to smoke pretty quickly. It may not have an overall effect on the quality of your food, but if you think about a lot of the donut fryers, um, open concept kitchens that have the fryers in the open, you start getting those smoking and rancid notes right away from the early polymerization products. Um, it can not give the same sweet notes that you're used to using 
the partial hydro um, product earlier. And then don'ts. This one, I'm going to be honest with you, kind of surprised me the most as the part of the industry that took on to highlight soybean the quickest and, and had the most effect on it. You know, with donut frying, typically what happens is um, they don't have to worry about oil stability because their donuts pick up so much oil, they're constantly adding new oil to it, and so it's not a big issue. But what we found out is they're actually one of the biggest pullers of the highlight soybean oil. Typically, they use a solid shortening or at least a creamy shortening where you incorporate some of the saturated levels into the shortening, whether it's through IE or physical blend. And um, to give it that nice, rich mouth feel that's not too greasy on your hands or too waxy as well. So um, these are just some of the interesting finds that we did through some of our application works there. You can see uh, kind of the donut, uh, cake donut cut in half on top. A lot of things that people look for, especially in the donut industry, is how it affects the the actual texture of the product, and you can see uh, a lot of them look at the star shape in the middle, and you, partial hydrogenation and the enzymatic intersterified highlight soybean oil were neck and neck as a great drop-in replacement options. And then down on the bottom right, you can see uh, yeast-raised donuts and some of the effects. Not a whole lot of differences on glaze adhesion, but that's something they definitely look at. You want something that will, is able for that glaze to adhere to the donut and not fall off. But one of the interesting things that we found is on the sugar retention, um, when you start to use things that are high in polyunsaturates, you start to deal with some weeping out that will leave a greasy mouthfeel, but will also cause wet spots on your donut for the um, powdered sugar um, to show, and that's not really desirable in the eye. You know, another interesting thing about donuts is uh, the change in texture over time. You know, donuts are at the peak flavors when they first pull out. If anybody's not had a hot donut, I highly recommend it. It's delicious. <laughs> but even so, a lot of the donut producers, they sell fresh donuts, you know, usually baked that day. And then maybe they have a day old donut that they sell as well. But you can start to taste that staleness um, even from that 24 hour. So we took a look at that too, and they change in force using that texture analyzer over 24 hours and had some really interesting findings. Um, you know, that stability not only measures well in the fryer, but also measures well in the end product as well. You can see here the change in force over 24 hours. Um, you want a low number. You want that number to be as low as possible to, so that there's less perceived staleness over time. And you can see highlight soybean oil, intersterified, um, actually outperform um, partially hydrogenated soybean oil in this product, but um, maybe Palm and Commodity IE struggled a little bit preserving that freshness over time. Now, once we get into the bakery options, here's just a quick run through of some of the common off-the-shelf, all-purpose bake bakery um, products out there and the fatty acid composition of those. You can see, especially with the palm and IE commodity soybean oil, um, and even the partial hydro, there were some, um, depending on how far you took it through the partial hydrogenation process, some of the fatty acid differences, and especially that green, um, side there. You know, the saturates are all relatively neck and neck. You know, we tried to pick products that were off the shelf and had relatively the same amount of saturates in there. But where you really see a difference is on the polyunsaturates, especially on the palm blend and um, the commodity IE. High like soy, you're left with a, a oleic content that's at relatively high, taking up some of that polyunsaturate, which is going to prove well, especially in bakery applications. Next, we'll talk about cakes. Cakes is an interesting one because, you know, if you have a good uh, baker, um, typically they can deal with what, you're, what, what you give them. But, you know, some of the things that we really um, get calls on from time to time is the structure, the structure side, and even the mixing. We want something that um, has a good um, blending incorporation. You don't want to change your times on any of the mixing because that will really affect the overall texture of your cake. Some of the things we looked at in this case are the dome bite. You want to see how well it raises and then how well it sets once it gets to that um, um, that baking height. And then compare that to your, your what we consider the dome edge height. And you can see, based on these, partial hydros, um, depending on where in the um, shelf life of the shortening, uh, whether it be initial six months or 12 months, stayed relatively consistent throughout. But even if you look to the far right, um, the interesterified highlight soybean oil did very well 
um, throughout the shelf life, keeping it very consistent dome height and very close, closest to what we consider the industry standard for the partial hydrogenated product. Uh, here's just another instance of cakes. This kind of gives you a little bit more clarity on between the generation one that we talked about, just the commodity poem, commodity IE, versus the generation two, where we start to look at some of those um, advantages in processing to give us consistent crystal structure, um, not necessarily going on to the partially uh, or the enzymatically interstellar but high lit. Um, may not be needed in a case like this, but you can see um, the crystal structure is, is very important in the texture and density of cakes. And this just kind of gives you a, a cross cut of the differences between them. Cookies, cookies is another one that's difficult because you know you don't think a lot about cookies when you're dealing with the application side. A good baker can typically work with whatever they're giving. But um, if you were to take the approach of drop-in replacement, um, you know, this is something we're very interested in because a lot of times the big manufacturers don't want to make changes to their processing um, just to suit a new type of shortening that's out there. So we really focused on the, being able to um, provide a drop-in replacement. Um, so some of the things that we looked at on this are just the spread and height, pretty general um, application base looks. But when you think about things like packaging um, and other aspects like that, the size of the cookie is, is, is really important. So um, in comparing it to the, uh, what we were commonly used before in the partial hydrogenated oils, you can see that high oleic soybean oil was very similar in the spread and height. Um, the, one of the issues that we run into a lot with something that has high polyunsaturates is that spread tends to um, go out so you have much wider, flatter cookies and maybe won't give you the same texture and mouthfeel that you're used to. Um, previously. Uh, buttercream icing, you know, this is one of those, you know, that Bob mentioned before is probably in that area where you're looking for a more customized option out there and there's not really a good drop in replacement. But I think with our uh, generation three products out there, you know, this is one of the few products out there, the enzymatically interstarified high oleic soybean oil, that could be a really good drop in replacement. Um, you know, some of the issues that we run into, especially now, we just talked about the weather and we saw those cubes that um, maybe were manipulated due to heat uh, abuse during transportation. Well, you think about a cake decorator, some of the obstacles that they have to deal with as well. Someone up here or maybe even farther north when they have to deal with some really cold type uh, weathers. Uh, when you're trying to decorate a cake that will maintain that nice mouthfeel, creamy melt-away mouthfeel that buttercream is known for in a cold weather, um, it can often lead to, especially if you're using a, a product with a short working range, lead to something that gives you a crunchy, waxy mouthfeel. Same problem, different type, down in those in Miami or somewhere like that where they want that nice, beautiful beach wedding. You gotta decorate that cake and you gotta make sure you bring it out to that beach and not have the icing slide off the cake, right? So, um, two different problems that PHO had the previous opportunity to offer one product for both areas. Uh, so now you see a lot of uh, suppliers offering a winter and a summer option, for, especially for um, applications like this. Um, you know. Typically with our um, high oleic soybean oil incorporated with our generation two technology, we're able to offer that one product that's available for both um, weather regions um, and get away from offering a summer and a winter. You can just imagine if they had a foot of snow last week and now we're in 80 degree weather, what a logistical nightmare it is to offer two products. High cross, I'm hoping that that picture on the left is starting to get your mouth water and stomach rumbling and everything like that. Uh, but, you know, this is one of those application studies that you just you just hate to be part of the sensory part panel. Of it. You got a delicious flaky crust up there in the, in the top left. Uh, but you can also see some of the issues that they're running into in the industry with the pie crust in the picture on the right. Um, it doesn't cream into the product as well, especially when you're dealing with the initial generation one products. Um, so you're having to take different mixing type uh, parameters to get you that same product. But uh, there are issues that 
can develop if you over mix or under mix a product. Uh, one of the products down here is the dough rolled out in the, um, I guess that would be in the bottom center. You can actually see chunks of short meat in there. And the issue with that is it will actually melt out and create a fry spot in the bottom. Uh, you want a nice consistent browning on the bottom, as you see in the bottom right. I'm just going to touch on these last ones really quick. Laminated dough, this is another one that probably is going to require a customized solution that I like so you know, will give us a little bit more flexibility with. You think about laminated dough, you want to create a nice even layer between the, the uh, layers of dough and you don't want it to melt out because that will cause problems in the actual webbing and um, texture of the pastry when you're done. So just kind of quick uh, summary of why it's so painful. Well, Stability is one of them, and we kind of covered a great drop-in uh, possibility for that, utilizing the uh, science of high light soybean oil. Uh, performance, you know, we talked about that being the Generation 2 products where you really go in there and uh, pay attention to the processing and manipulating that crystal structure to give you a robust product. And then the economics, you know, we're taking advantage of some of these products, and some of these may not be as economically feasible as others. But if you take a blending approach, uh, you'll be able to take some of those great, um, some of those great advantages from them in uh, a blend type um, atmosphere. So, uh, thank you for your kind attention, and uh, this is just a quick example of some of our branded products out there. So, thank you.